In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Hello and welcome everyone um, to the 12th, I believe 12th, is that correct, Sabuna? 12th annual um, evangelism. 14th. 15th. Anyone for 16? All right. Well, welcome to the annual evangelism conference. This year, we're going to combine both evangelism with apologetics. Apologetics, defending the Christian faith. So the theme of this year's conference is timeless truth for truthless times. Timeless truth for truthless times. Uh, much needed truth in much needed time. Um, we will begin, we will have the uh, conference, you have all the schedules with you. We will begin the first lecture uh, in the next few minutes by His Grace Bishop Yusuf. Father Sayyidina. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Actually, uh, my lecture tonight is about different styles for evangelism. What do I mean by this? Uh, many of our youth are interested in evangelism. So, some of them actually, they think about going uh, to the homeless and feed them. Other, they go to squares or malls and start to sing and, and, and invite people to come to the church. Others, they um, think about like doing Bible study for you know uh, evangelism uh, people. Uh, our target, whom are uh, uh, targeting, you know, to, to know Christ and to know the gospel. And many of us, when we hear about this style or that style, we say, no, no, this is not the right way of evangelism. You know, uh, going just to, to feed the homeless is not evangelism. That's we can call it humanitarian service. No, 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 just going to the uh, mall and, and invite people or just distributing flyer is not evangelism. So actually, in the scripture, uh, we found many types of evangelism, many styles of evangelism. So what I will do tonight, we will read passages from scripture. And then with each passage, we will discover a style of evangelism, a different style. To tell you that it's not one style. There are many ways to evangelize. And then, for each style, we'll speak about its strength. And for each style, we will give some red flags. What I mean, uh, warning. Be careful. For this style, in order to be successful in evangelism, you need to watch for this and that. That's what we'll do. And through the grace of God, uh, I was able to uh, find nine different styles for evangelism, and this is what we'll discuss tonight. The first style, uh, I want you to, if you have your Bible with you, turn it to Acts chapter 7.
Then the high priest said, said to St. Stephen, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he went in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And he continued actually to speak from the scripture about God's uh, plan for salvation. Until verse, uh, verse 35. This Moses, whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And then actually, in verse, uh, verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So if we reflect about the style of St. Stephen here, what do you think about this style? What did he do? Actually, they were trying him. He was in a trial. But instead of defending himself, what did he do? He started to explain God's economy of salvation from the Old Testament. And then what did he do for them? Actually, he challenged them. He confronted them. He rebuked them. He convicted them. Right? This style, actually, we call it the prophetic style. That's number one, style number one. The prophetic style. The word the prophecy means he has message from God. That's the word the prophecy, delivering message from God to the people. So people with the prophetic style, they use the scripture to confront the people the sin and to call them for repentance. There's a prophetic style. They use the scripture to confront the sin of the people and call the people for repentance. That's what St. Stephen did. He used the scripture, he confronted them, you resist the Holy Spirit. You reject the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. You killed the Lord Jesus Christ. So, whether in public or in private interaction, they actually skip small talk. They don't focus on small talks. But they want to get to the point. What's the point? To lead people to repent and to confront their sins and to tell them, this is what the scripture says. They have a strong conviction and opinion about the word of God. And they communicate biblical principle, not personal preferences or not personal biases. Uh, and usually they have sense of urgency in obtaining response from the people. They have sense of urgency in obtaining response. They want to hear, we believe. Yes, we repent. Uh, also, they are willing to say hard things. Like St. Stephen, you stiff-necked. You stiff-necked. You know? So they are willing to say 
hard things like John the Baptist, serpents, brood of vipers, repent, bear fruit that befits repentance. So there is tendency here to say hard things and hold people accountable to the biblical values. People in this style, they are bold, direct, and prefer face-to-face -face interaction. Actually, the example is St. Stephen. Another example is John the Baptist. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he used this example. Actually, we will find the Lord Jesus Christ used maybe the nine examples that I will use today. In order to tell you, there is only not only one example. In Matthew chapter 15, He actually confronted the people. Uh, he told them, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So here's the Lord Jesus Christ used the scripture to confront the, the, the people's sin to lead them to repentance. You, you follow me? With, uh, you understand this style? Okay. So what are the strengths of this style? And what are the red flags? Warning. We need to be careful if I am using this style in evangelism. Actually, the strength of this style, it's direct. It's clear. And uh, people here they listen to the word of God. And the word of God is living, sharper than two-edged sword, pierce into the heart. It can actually change the people. It can transform them. And people using this style, they respect the scripture. And they believe in its power and ability to bring conviction. They respect the scripture and believe in its power and ability to bring conviction. And these people are verbally articulate. That's the prophetic style. What are the things that they should be careful about? Actually, sometimes they fail to consider the feeling of the people was using you know harsh or, or, or direct words like uh, serpents brood of vipers you know so maybe i have to be uh, watchful lest i lack sensitivity in 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 um, in preaching to others and maybe I will sound offensive instead of gaining the people to uh, the word of God. That's why in the prophetic style, actually, uh, I should remind myself always that love through action and service is important. Love through action and service is important. Considering the feelings of others is important. Considering how to be gentle with others is very, very important. And let me tell you, most of the people who used this style in, uh, in the scripture used it in public. Very rarely they used it, you know, in, in private to, co to confront a certain person. Maybe like John the Baptist when he confronted uh, King Herod. But most of the time, it's used in, 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 pub in public, you know. That's the first style. We call it prophetic style.
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because if you speak Muslim to a certain person in front of you, and you say this is harshness, this is you know uh, hardness of heart, it's different from just talking to one person and you tell him serpents fruit of viable. You know, <laughs> this may be a little bit harsh. The second style. Uh, second style, let me read from Peter, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 3. You know, this is the story of healing the lame man. And St. Peter, actually, when he saw the lame man healed, and the people start to, to run to Peter, greatly amazed of this miracle. So verse 12, so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why you look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, etc., etc., etc. So here this style is different than the first one. How? Actually, this style, he is, 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 is a person looks for opportunity or any circumstances to communicate the gospel message to the people expecting them to respond. It's not confrontational like the first one. There is no rebuke. But here, St. Peter actually took this opportunity, the miracle that God performed to this man. So he took this opportunity to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ and to call people to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so these people take the initiative and they utilize a straightforward approach to the word of God. Uh, but they are not confrontational like the first type. That's why we call them proclaimer. And the style will call it proclamation. They proclaim the word of God. And they are initiative in, in taking opportunity and watching for opportunity and circumstances in order to preach the word of God. Also, they have a sense of urgency that people hear the gospel and they, they need to respond. Also, like the first style, they are direct and verbal. The Lord Jesus Christ used this style too. Do you know when? After his baptism, he entered the temple. Then they gave him the book of Isaiah. So he read from the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. We read it in Luke chapter 4. And after actually he read this passage, he told them, today in your ears this prophecy was fulfilled. So he took this opportunity actually to proclaim the word of God, the gospel of God. So that is the second style. We call it proclamation. Uh, and, and, and the person here should be watchful. Maybe you are speaking with your friend in school or at work, you know, and there's opportunity. How to take, to be initiative and to take advantage of this opportunity to bring the word of God and to speak to him about, you know, Christ. That is the, the second style. The strength of this style is it is clear insightful and use the word of God. Also, uh, it is initiative and take advantage of every opportunity. And maybe this is what St. Paul said, and the Lord has opened a door for me. So he looks at every opportunity as a door opened by the Lord. So the Create opportunities instead of passively waiting for opportunities. 
they create opportunities instead of passively waiting for opportunity. And they are ready to share the gospel of God. They are ready, the word of God in their mind. And actually they look at the hand of God in every event. They are ready to share the gospel of God. But what is the, the, the weakness or what these people using this style should be careful about? Maybe they uh, do not connect with all types of people. Also, sometimes they rely on outline instead general outline instead of responding to the needs of this specific person or this specific situation the first style actually it 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 respond to the need of the person like john the Bible, it's unlawful for you to take your brother's wife to be your wife but the second style it is general so sometimes you know if i'm not careful maybe i will not address the need of the situation or the need of the person because I'm using general outline uh, and if I'm not careful maybe I will focus on just uh, trans uh, transferring the information not the connection with the person you know I have some information in my mind I need to transfer it but I'm not connected with here and now and this situation and the need of, of, of the present time. And sometimes these people, they are rigid and unadaptable. Rigid and unadaptable. So that's the second style. Third style, uh, let's read Acts chapter 17. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship Without knowing him, I proclaim to you. He was speaking to people, Greek, not from Jewish background, so they don't know the scripture. So he cannot use the scripture to preach to them, to evangelize to them. That's why he's different from the prophetic and from the proclaimers. He relied here on what? He relied on the intellect. That's why we call this style the intellectual. The intellectual. The intellectual actually goes with uh, apologetics. Yes, but, but the proclaimers in the style that I'm explaining, he proclaims the word of God. But here St. Paul was speaking to people who do not know the word of God. They were not Jewish. Actually, he, he quote one of their uh, poets, you know. Uh, so here he used the intellect more than the scripture. Because, for example, if you are preaching or evangelizing to an atheist, if you use the scripture, he will tell you, I don't believe in this. So here you need to rely more on the reason, on the logic, you know. And, and li like this series, Case for Christ, Case for Creator uh, by Lee Strop, you know, he used the intellect to convince the people, right? So here the intellectuals attempt to make case for Christianity. They use knowledge, historic proof, philosophical construct, scientific analysis, common sense, 
in order to make a rational appeal for Christianity. So they are using these things in order to use uh, national appeal for Christianity. Uh, they seek to appeal to people through their minds. They speak to the people through their mind. And actually some of us as servants or as clergy, uh, sometimes in our preaching we are very logical. We use logic and reason in order actually to, to persuade the people. The Lord himself used this style in Matthew 22. Do you know when? When actually they asked him, should we give taxes to, to, to Caesar or not? So here the, the Lord, how he responded to them by logic. He told them, show me the tax man. So they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. So he said to them, render therefore to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So here he used the logic to convince the people. That's the style we call it the intellectual. Of course, the strength of this style it validate and protect the truth of the gospel for all situation and all cultures and all uh, uh, ethnic background. And they try to make the gospel acceptable to the intellectual. Or in other words, they take the intellectual barriers that may keep the people away from Christianity. And these people, they are learnable and they are actually good teachers. They teach good. But what are the weakness of this style? What are the things they should be careful about? Sometimes they get stuck on the academic and philosophy and theories and evidences instead of focusing on the gospel. That's why they should be careful using the intellect and the reason just introduction. But at the end, the focus on the word of God, on Christ. They may present the gospel as mere intellectual concept rather than uh, a reali reality for salvation. They may overlook the role of the Holy Spirit in bringing people to faith. You know, the, the Bible teaches us nobody can say Jesus is God except by the Holy Spirit. So actually, if I'm or, or relying only on the intellect, reason, maybe just I will trust using reason is, is what I need. So I will not pray before I, I give a lecture. I ignore the role of the Holy Spirit in actually convicting the people and bringing people to faith. Also, not everybody will, 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 will like you know using reason and intellect. That's why they may overwhelm uh, people with many, many uh, facts or reason or logic or philosophy, or sometimes because they are intellectual, so sometimes they may put people down or humiliate them or make fun of them in the process of explaining Christianity and the gospel. That is the third type. So we spoke about prophetic, proclamation, and intellectual. Number four, uh, Proverbs chapter 7. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. Four. 
For at the window of my house, I look to throw my lattice. And so among the simple, I perceived among the youth, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path to her house in the tewy light, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner, etc. Here actually, King Solomon wants to teach lesson about what? About purity, about avoiding sexual immorality. So what style he used here to teach? What style? Storyteller. That's what we say. It's a storyteller. You know? Uh, that's the fourth style. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ used this. The parables, Matthew 13. All of it, just parables and stories. So this can be an, another style in evangelism. So storytellers try to communicate theological truth through analogies or parables. They communicate uh, theological truth through analogies or parables. Uh, so th these stories actually connect the, the needs of the people to the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how in the Lord Jesus Christ they will find, you know, their salvation. So they connect the story of the people to the story of the Lord. And they need a lot of creativity in order to make these analogies and these stories. Uh, they use actually personal impact more than memorized gospel verses or gospel stories. They have the, the, the biblical principle in their mind. But they don't use the stories from the scripture, but they create their own stories in order to address the needs of the people. They think metaphorically. And these people are often artists. Uh, they have this gift. Or musicians. They are talkative, sociable. And they are humble. The strength of this style, actually, they communicate the gospel in a memorable style. Usually, we remember the stories. So they communicate the, the, the word of God in a memorable style. They appeal to the imagination of the people through stories. All of us who like stories like the stories, uh, and bring scripture to life by connecting the biblical stories to the people's need. And uh, they address, actually, uh, all the needs, or most of the needs of the people through uh, stories that make sense to them. And sometimes they use stories from nature. Sometimes they use the story from uh, the animal world, they use many stories in order to be able to get the message through. But what is the weakness here? The weakness, sometimes they get caught up in the story and fail to connect it with the message of the gospel. Also, there is no story or parable is perfect in transferring to us the biblical truth. And this is actually the problem with some, when we try to interpret some of the parables. For example, people uh, with the parable of the 10 virgins, the five wise and five foolish, or the unjust steward, 
you know, some, some people actually, if they want to get all the truth from this parable, they get stuck. Because the parable is a story. It's limited. No story or no parable can actually transfer to you all the, the biblical truth. That's why the storytellers may limit the listener's understanding of the gospel by the limitation of the analogy being used. Because there is no perfect story or analogy. There is no perfect story or analogy. Also, sometimes they need to learn how to tell stories that are confrontational in nature in order actually to move the people's heart to accept the gospel. Style number four or five? Five. Style number five. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 26. St. Paul actually was uh, in a trial before uh, Agrippa, King Agrippa. So St. Paul actually started to speak, I think myself happy, verse 2, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself, etc., etc., until we go to, to verse 12 or verse 11. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied as a journey to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me. And those who journeyed with me, and when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the gods, etc. So actually, at the end of this uh, defense, uh, Agrippa told him, uh, you are about to, 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 to make me Christian. So actually, he used this opportunity to preach and to evangelize. But what is the style here that he is using? He's using what? Personal experience, very good. Yeah, testimony. testimony. That's what we call testimonial. So he is using his testimony, actually, to preach to the people, like the blind man in John chapter nine. He told them, "A sinner is he? I don't know, but what I know that I was blind." And now I can see. And the Lord Jesus Christ actually used this when he spoke about his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 and 15. This, uh, so he spoke about as if his personal experience, you know, his personal testimony about his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's what we call testimonial. Testimony actually they, uh, they share their own story. They share their own personal story. As they listen to others, they are reminded of the work of God in their own life. And they connect with others through shared experience, how God worked in my life and how he worked in your life. And their personal story point to the Lord Jesus, not to themselves, to the work of God in my life, not to me as a godly person or as a holy person. And actually, many of these people, they are vulnerable about their personal lives, and they can share their downs and ups with others. They are not ashamed to say, 
you know, I was a blasphemer and persecutor of the church of God, like St. Paul. He said, I was a blasphemer and persecutor. So they are not ashamed to say, I was drug addict. But that's what God did with me. What is the strength? They appeal to life experience. And this sometimes can be more convincing, you know. I was in this situation, but God had mercy on me. So he can have mercy on you too. And they identify with people and make them feel affirmed. And they build a relationship with others and connect with others through vulnerability and empathy. But this style actually, we have concern about using it a lot. Because there is like a fine line between pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ or vain glory. That's why sometimes when St. Paul spoke about one of his ups, you know, a positive experience, he spoke about it in the third person. I know a man in Christ ascended in the third heaven. When he speak about negative, he said, I was a blasphemer and persecutor. But when he spoke about visions, he spoke about it in the third person in order to avoid falling into vainglory. This style is, is, although it's used, but we need to be very, very careful in using this style. Why? Because it may rely too much on experience than the word of God. So actually, I'm preaching my own experience, not the word of God, not the gospel of Christ or may communicate the message that the gospel is subjective, not objective. Or they may fail to tell the whole gospel because they are focusing only on their own testimony and their experience. So I'm fo focusing on the verses in the Bible or passages in the Bible that touched my life, but other passages that did not touch my life, I, I, I cannot communicate it to others. And maybe they assume that their listeners' experience are like their own experience, which sometimes is not the case. So this is uh, another style. So we spoke about uh, prophetic, proclaimers, intellectual, uh, storytellers, and testimonial, right? Number six. Turn your Bible to John chapter 1. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me. For he was before me. I did not know him, but he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Then actually, verse 35 or 37, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Uh, verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon <coughs> and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. 
and he brought him to Jesus. Verse 43. And the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Philip, verse 45, found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. So this style actually is we, uh, we, we call it interactive. You can see here there is interaction. In the interactive style, people tend to focus on establishing relationship with others as an avenue to communicate the word of God. So like he befriends the others to preach to them. The Lord Jesus Christ used this style. With whom? With the Samaritan woman. At the beginning, she was very defensive. You're a Jewish, I'm a Samaritan. How you speak to me? How you ask me to, uh, to drink? So he started to interact with her. He didn't start by preaching. He tried to make friend out of her. And then he was able actually to communicate the gospel of Christ. So these people, they are able to make friendship and relationship, creates, people for, uh, creates, creates space for people. They reach out to people. And they quickly uh, uh, feel accepted and included by the others. They enter into relationship with others. And they wait patiently for a strategic and teachable moments to communicate the word of God. So they make the, the, the friendship and they wait until a moment to communicate uh, and verbalize the word of God. They are prepared to apply the word of God uh, at various situations and uh, friendships they find themselves involved in. So the, the, the strategy here to make relationship, to make friendship, and then through this friendship, they will verbalize and communicate the word of God. The strength here of this style, they make people feel affirmed and heard. There is a relationship. And easily develop friends with many types of people. These are sociable people. They value the uniqueness and individuality of others. They know each person is different. But the warning here, maybe they are not willing to risk the friendship by sharing the gospel. Sometimes, you know, they feel, okay, should I compromise? What if I used the word of God and this actually compromises the friendship, the relationship. So maybe they are not willing to risk the relationship by sharing the gospel. Or sometimes they will never get to the point of sharing the gospel. They just continue to be friends for years, waiting for a moment to share the gospel. So maybe they need to work on boldness and speak the truth of the gospel to the friends even taking the risk to uh, compromise the relationship. And maybe they need to learn not to shy away from appropriate conflict. You know, the Lord said, I come to turn the son against the father and the daughter against the, the mother. And, you know, because sometimes the word of God may cause conflict. People, when they disagree, it will cause conflict. So what should I compromise here? Of course, we should not compromise the truth of the gospel. Um, style number seven. Let's hand it. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter five.
the, the purpose of this uh, lecture is to tell you it is not only one style, actually. There are different styles, you know, that c it can help us. It's not only one, one style. Uh, uh, sorry, it is Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter nine, not chapter five. For verse nine. 9-9, nine, nine, Matthew 9-9. Nine, nine. And Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So Matthew, when he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and when he heard him and followed him, what did he do? He invited his friend. That's what we call uh, invitation, invitational style. Just you invite. You bring your friend to the church. You bring your friend to, to Bible study. Like Matthew. Matthew did not speak from scripture. He was not prophetic, not proclaimer, not a storyteller. He just told them, you know, I have dinner tonight in my house. Jesus is coming and his disciples just join us. Come. That's his way of evangelism. He invited the people. People who are using this style, they are hospitable. And always invite people to events, Bible study, liturgy, you know, church activity. They network well. They have good networking in order to help the community, the church community, to be effective. I can they call them, they are bringers, includers. They invite people, bring people, include people. Uh, they are social, persuasive, and also humble. Another example is the example of the Samaritan woman. And, and she went and invited the people, come see, man told me all what I did. The strength of these people, they make the outreach successful. And actually, they are aware of many circumstances that can be good opportunities for the outreach. And they act as a bridge from the world to the church. They invite the people. So they are bridge from the world to the church. But the weakness or things they should be aware of, they rely on others to verbalize the gospel. Like I told you about Matthew, he didn't know the gospel. He wants, you know, just bring people to Christ, then Christ will tell the gospel. So I bring people to the church and Abuna will, will, will tell, tell them, you know, what they need to do. Uh, and maybe they fail to experience God working through the direct ministry to others. Because just they bring the people, but they don't see the work of God in the life of others. They need to work on dealing with the natural conflict that the gospel may bring. As I told you, the gospel, as the Lord said, I did not come to bring peace, but sword. Sometimes the word of gospel brings sword. So sometimes they, they avoid such situations. Because they don't want to bring... For example, if, if he brings his friend from uh, school and to the church, and then Abuna said to his friend, you cannot take communion. So there is a conflict here. 
So he'll be offended and say, you know, I'm not going to bring anybody else to the church. They, they, they don't, they are not ready to take conflict. They may need to realize that the gospel itself saves not only the invitation and the events. Because they may bring people, for example, trip. So they invite people to trip, to conference, to sports day, you know. And, and they don't bring the people to the message of the gospel or to the church of God. So they should know that the church, the, the message of the gospel saves not only the event. So am I bringing the people to the event or to Christ? That's another thing. Uh, the, seven, the, the eighth style, number eight, right? Number eight. Uh, in Mark chapter two, Uh, verse 3. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when he had broken through, they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. This is style, what we call, it is service. You actually bring people to Christ or you evangelize by serving them. Serving them. So, this, this style, the attempt to care for the real needs of the people. They are empathetic and sympathetic. They place high value on actions. They seek to bring relief to others through practical service. They tend to have concern for social justice. And sometimes their kindness usually comes at a personal cost. They are patient, gentle, and sacrificial. Like people who go and feed the homeless, feed the poor, serve these people, etc. And actually, the disciples do this exa example in Acts chapter 6 when they found that the widows of the Greek were not taken care of. So actually, they appointed seven deacons to serve the needs of these widows. The strength of this style. They speak love in practical ways. They don't preach about love, but they speak it in practical ways. Uh, it's a strong and appealing lifestyle, serving others, sacrificing your life for others. They demonstrate the mercy and the kindness of God. Uh, and actually, they break down the, the, the negative stereotype in the minds of the people about the Lord Jesus Christ and about the gospel. What do I mean by this? Some people, they feel the Lord Jesus is harsh, for example. It's not kind. That's negative impression, negative image in their mind. Or they say, you know, all the people in the church are hypocrites. Most of the people that go to church, they are arrogant. So they break this stereotype, negative stereotype, in the minds of the people because they show and demonstrate you know, a Christian style uh, of, of love and humbleness and service. Uh, and actually, uh, they pave the way for the people to listen and to accept the word of the gospel. Because when you take care of the needs of the people, people can listen to the word of the gospel. And they will believe it because it's coming from you 
who is kind and showing love and empath uh, uh, empathetic with them. But what's the weakness? You know, we see, for example, evangelistic group in one of the churches just feeds the homeless on a weekly basis, but they never share the word of God. No. Then it's not an evangelistic, you know, it's just a humanitarian service. So they may never get to the gospel. They, they just stop by serving the needs of the other. And this will not be an evangelism. That's why they need to sharpen their ability to express the gospel. They need to connect their service with the reason for the service. Why I'm doing all this service? So if just I serve the people and that's it, what's the point? They need to connect their service with the reason of the service. Sometimes they focus so much on actions that the purpose of service could be lost. So they shouldn't be like Martha, serving but the purpose is lost, right? The last style, number nine, uh, Let's read Acts chapter Uh, no, actually, Acts chapter 4, verse 30, uh, or 30 29, verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So actually, these people actually, they rely on the power of God that demonstrated through wonders and miracles. They, they prayed, God, show wonders and miracles. Or the power of prayer, miracles. Uh, in order to witness for Christ. So uh, they, they look for a supernatural power to change the heart of the people. That's why we call this style a uh, power encounter, power encounter, because they actually look for a supernatural power to witness. And the strength of this style, they demonstrate the power of God. Through uh, this style, actually, they like to, to share a lot of miracles of scenes or supernatural experience in, in the life of the people. Uh, so the strength is to demonstrate the power of God, to get the attention of the people. Usually people like to, to listen to stories of, of miracles. Uh, and make the people willing to take risk because they trust in the power of God. 
But what is the weakness? Or what they should be aware of? Sometimes they rely too much on experience and emotion. Becomes emotional Christianity, you know, just they, they, they play on the emotions of the people. Not play, <laughs> they address the emotions of the people. That's why they need to sharpen their personal ability to share the word of God. They can tell you miracles of sins and stories of sins, but maybe they cannot share some verses from the scripture. So they need to sharpen their ability to verbally share the word of God. Uh, sometimes the focus is on the power, not on the God behind the power. The focus on the power or on the miracle more than God who is behind the power or behind the miracle. And sometimes they may over spiritualize situation. So yeah, just a, a normal event, but they, they over spiritualize it, you know, to sound like a miracle or sound like a supernatural event. So these are the nine, st nine styles of evangelism, uh, prophetic, proclaimers, intellectual, uh, storytellers, uh, testimonial, uh, invitation, uh, interactive, uh, service, and uh, power encounter. As I told you, the Lord Jesus Christ used all these styles. So it's not one style. But it's good actually to examine myself and see what's my tendency, wh which style I'm using a lot. Uh, and to be aware of its strength and to be aware also of its weakness so that you can grow on the strength and be careful about the weakness. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Any comments or questions?